Welcome, you're with Money, Money, Money. I'm Sumera Abdi. A very wise man once said, wealth is not created, it is saved. And in today's context, it's a process of good investment practices. So to invest is a given for wealth creation, right? Now to the processes. Do you go through an advisor? Do you decide for yourself? How much should you actually pay an advisor for the advice you're getting? Should they even be held accountable if returns are lower than the benchmarks or what's been promised? Well, you can invest easy because all of this actually forms part of the SEBI Investment Advisory Guidelines 2013. And here to give us the lowdown is Anurag Seth, the head of global wealth management at Qu Want capital. Anurag, thanks very much for speaking with us because this is a topic that actually hasn't been explored uh, a lot earlier, right? But first things first, you know, so everyone has a relationship manager. If I have a DMAT account, I also have someone who keeps, uh, you know, calling me up or messaging me the uh, recommendations. I have television. I have innumerable websites to choose from. Why do I even need an investment advisor? I think you covered it well. Uh, I think there is enough and more news that is available. So that's why it becomes very confusing for an investor of what to select and what not to select. Uh, so I think uh, first let's take a concept of why do you need, whether you need also investment advisor or a financial advisor or you can just walk into your branch and do the investment of what you think. Uh, I think and I keep on uh, giving this example again and again as you are in Financial advisor is like your financial doctor. Now, obviously, the doctor itself, you go by his experience, so you have to trust financial advisor based on the investment objective you need to meet. Mm -hmm. So once you have selected your investment objective, that is when you decide to hire a financial advisor, and that is how you then decide on which allocation to have. So I'll answer in simple words is, you have three phases of wealth. So one is wealth generation, the second phase comes is wealth accumulation and the third is wealth preservation. Mm -hmm. You need advisory to have your accumulation phase work for you. Okay. Because the generation phase is something that you are for a salaried class obviously mm -hmm. generating some income. Mm -hmm. Bulk of the income initially by Indian mm -hmm. you know standards goes by into the first objective is to buy a house. Yeah. Yeah. Now whether that objective will be met by only generating or also by increasing returns or investment. Mm -hmm. So I think that is the crux, that is why you need an advisor to advise you on which is the best option for you. Yeah, sometimes I think we think so much in singular lines or, you know, our, our thinking is so simplistic. We need somebody to actually complicate it for us, if I can yes. <laughs> use that analogy. Okay, now if I'm to go to an advisor, I have uh, a couple of options, right? Should I go to someone who's charging me a fee or should I go to a guy who's giving me advice for free and I don't care who he charges? There's a common misconception in the market saying investment advice or a financial advice comes for free. Hmm. There is nothing that comes for free. For direct equity, you pay a brokerage, you pay a certain nominal charges or what a DMAT charge or a, to buy and sell, you anyway pay. Yeah. For mutual funds, there are anyway commissions that get paid for all your investments you route through any of the advisors. So nothing in the world comes for free. So that is one. Second, why to go for a financial advisor hmm. and to charge a fee? So there are different models you can practice. Mm. So one is a fixed fee structure, mm. irrespective of my portfolio. Mm. And I think I, I need to cover on this point, a financial advisor also gives you an advice on your holistic portfolio. Mm. So like most of the clients when I meet, they'll have portfolios with different, different entities. Mm. So you'll have with one with a bank, with a local yeah. advisor, with a local broker. Mm. Becomes very difficult because each investment objective are different. So to that extent, one, financial advisor will give you a holistic advice. Now one is, as I told you, is a fixed fee structure. Mm. The other one you can link it to a performance based fee structure model. Mm. Mm. So where you base your investment objective and the liquidity needs, you allocate, mm. uh, you come to a conclusion of a hurdle rate. Mm. Depending on where the fixed yeah. returns are or a risk free return as you call it mm. are. Depending on you can load or what kind of risk you are taking. Mm. So if you are taking a debt, so anything between 9 to 10 percent, mm. if you're looking at equity is 12 to 15 percent. Mm. So depending on how the markets have performed over the last 
10, 20 years. Okay, yeah. so this is a difference between a fee-based and an execution-only model, right? But uh, I know and you know how mm -hmm. difficult it must be to actually get people to pay a fee. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I take off from your example of a doctor, right? You wouldn't want a doctor charging the pharma companies a commission mm -hmm. to recommend those medicines for you. And sure. therefore, you don't want your advisor actually charging a commission from the mutual funds or any other uh, investment. But how uh, difficult or easy is it to actually relay this to your clients? See, till the time you don't give him a holistic portfolio picture, it becomes very difficult. Because if you go on an execution basis, and that is where I think the most of the client mistrust is. Mm -hmm. Because what has happened is, over the years, the industry is just 15, 20 years old. Bulk of the portfolios have seen a cycle that is from 2003 to 2007, mm -hmm. and then 2008 to now. Uh, so to that extent, we need to be very clear in terms of what is the end objective. So that's why I say, so your investment objective needs to be very clear. Hmm. So the portfolio is positioned for a 9% kind of return, portfolio is positioned for a 15% kind of return. Hmm. And the associated risk should be well articulated. Hmm. Alright, so let's talk about returns then because that's I think the biggest stumbling block, hmm. right? Uh, an advisor can either charge a fixed percentage uh, annually or they can charge a percentage of the, your assets which they're managing or then there is the performance linked uh, structure which you spoke about. Yes. How do I decide which is the best option for me and how do I decide also which is the least biased because if I'm paying an annual fixed percentage wouldn't that give an incentive to an advisor to actually you know at some point just wander off with my portfolio? So as you spoke the different models available I'll, I'll take one by one so hmm. a fixed fee structure so what will it give you? It gives you, uh, so depending on what the investment objective has been, so a fixed fee structure would work for a conservative portfolio hmm. because my return expectation on my portfolio, basis my risk profile, is I'm expecting a 10%. Hmm. So on a 10% on a debt kind of return, it's always advisable to get into a fixed fee kind of structure. Okay. Now when I get into a risky assets of getting into an equity and I'm looking for the long-term investments, hmm. that is where the performance fee sharing Okay. works because obviously there is there is the role for a financial mm -hmm. advisor to play because the fixed fee structure is for a long for a long term mm -hmm. debt products and that is so much of you can do on a debt yeah. side so <laughs> there's not much to do about yeah. it depending on your you know there's enough to do on a debt side also depending on where the rates are and how do you place mm -hmm. it depending on GSEC mm -hmm. or mutual funds or a direct mm -hmm. debt exposure but on equity side I think there's much more to do in terms of mm -hmm. the risk also Hmm. the client is taking and obviously the risk basis the risk hmm. what is the return potential I get so that is where the performance fee sh structure falls okay. and that is how the client agrees on a particular hurdle rate hmm. but then you can't have a different hurdle rate for a debt for a different yeah. portfolio so hmm. everyone is talking about a portfolio return hmm. what one should do is link your investment objective to a portfolio return hmm. okay so that the advisor is giving you one hmm. so it, should it matter to you on what debt has given you and what equity has given you or should it matter to you of your 100 rupees how much has it grown yeah. for a year? Yeah. No, that makes sense entirely, mm -hmm. right? But which is the best way to actually look at it? Should the returns be benchmarked against an index or should they be absolute that, you know, if I give you 10% returns, this is my fee. If I give you 50 whatever or every 5% thereafter, the fee alters. Mm -hmm. Then the other way to look at it is what if your index uh, gives negative returns? If you've given lower negative returns, does it, does it just mean that you've overperformed? Okay. Uh, see, I think your benchmark should mm -hmm. not be, uh, should only be, rather I would mm -hmm. say it should only be a risk-free return. Mm -hmm. So a GSEC return can be a good benchmark okay. of how the portfolio should do. So based on what the current benchmark is on a government security, that becomes your benchmark both for debt and a percentage loaded for because we are mm. taking a risk, a percentage loaded on an equity side. Mm. So to that extent, seven and a half, eight percent can be a good benchmark for current year. And depending on where it behaves next year, you can keep on revising it. So that is one option. Mm. Second, a performance fee should also be linked to your what kind of risk you are taking. Mm. So if I'm, I'm okay, if I as a client, I'm looking for something more than an inflation. Mm. I'm talking about the real inflation. That yeah affects the common people or the investor class, then you are looking at a 12-15% kind of return. Mm. So basic that, that becomes your minimum hurdle rate. Mm. But it will be unfair for a client when he gets a risk-free return of 7.5%, but they are charging for a, and so 
covering your coming back to your point of relative to benchmark. Mm. So in a scenario like a 2008, where you know markets are down 50 percent, mm. and through my active management, I've generated say a 10 percent, mm. or a portfolio down 20 percent. So mm. I haven't outperformed. I have outperformed to the benchmark. Yeah, relative. But the mandate at the start of it was not to give a negative. <laughs> yeah. So the advisor, I think it's more important for an advisor to understand there can be years where it doesn't pay. It doesn't get fees because the, there's so much which is out of your control. Hmm. You can't hmm. help. Hmm. Say a bulk of a client is sitting on a 80% equity and a 20% debt portfolio, and in a scenario where the markets are down, hmm. you know, any global event or something that yeah. is not in control. So obviously at that year, but obviously the subsequent year will make hmm. 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 a better return for a client and obviously a better fee for yourself. Okay, so therefore the interests of both the advisor and the client ultimately get aligned to a it single has to be real. It has to be aligned. So alignment of interest, alignment of objective mm -hmm. and alignment of how the risk profile goes has mm -hmm. to be a continuous process. Alright, so we'll take a break on that note but we're not done just yet. We're going to come back in just a bit, continue this topic with Anurag Seth and we'll also try and figure out where mutual funds and their commissions actually figure in this entire scenario. Stay tuned to Money, Money, Money. Thank you.